Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the people of God say, Amen. So I've never been on a boat in the middle of a storm. Have you? Oh, some, some are nodding. Some are nodding. The closest I ever came was when I was a young man. I was 19, maybe. And I took an overnight ferry ride from Aarhus in Denmark through the Skagerrak Sea to Oslo, the capital of Norway. Now, the Skagerrak is a strait that runs from the northern tip of Denmark to the southeastern coast of Norway. It could kind of connect the North Sea to the Baltic Sea, and getting there by ferry takes a very long time. Like we left in the late afternoon, if I remember that right, traveled all night, and arrived in Oslo early in the, ne the next morning. It was supposed to be a smooth ride, <laughs> but guess what? The sea unexpectedly decided to misbehave that night. And before long, the ferry was groaning and moving and swinging back and forth as it made its way through the increasingly violent waves. That was not a fun experience. But then neither was the boat ride that Jesus took with his disciples that night on the Sea of Galilee. See, here in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has just finished a major teaching gig. He's lectured on what the kingdom of God is like. He's told stories. He's compared God's kingdom to a mustard seed. We heard that story last week. And now at the end of a long, hot day, he is ready for some rest. He's tired. He needs a break. He needs to get away from the crowds. And so he says to his friends, Let, let's go. Let's go to the other side of the sea. Let's get away from all these people over here. Let's cross, cross over and find a quiet place somewhere over there. Well, Jesus has done this before, right? More than once, he has needed to get away from it all, has needed a break, and has looked for a quiet place to rest and to recharge his batteries. We get that way too, don't we? We often work ourselves to the point where it seems like we can't go another step. Maybe it's a particularly heavy workload that week. Or we get so busy with household chores and doctor's appointments and work schedules, or we have trouble with the kids who are worn out going to school via Zoom and demanding more of our attention than we can possibly give. Whatever it is, you know that your life can just get just as busy and get you to the point where you just need a little rest, a little awe and awe, a little peace. Well, that's where Jesus is in this story today. So he suggests to get to the other side, leaving the crowd behind, as Mark says. <laughs> but Mark also reports that other boats were with him. D did you catch that little detail? Did you? Other boats were with him. In other words, once again, people are following him wherever he goes. There's no getting away for Jesus. He's exhausted. He's at the end of his energy. He's dead tired. So no wonder he falls asleep right there in the boat while it crosses the Sea of Galilee. A great windstorm arose, Mark tells us, seemingly out of nowhere. We are not told what happens to those other boats, but Mark reports that the boat Jesus is in was being swamped by the waves and in danger of capsizing and sinking. But Jesus, he sleeps right through it all. <laughs> you know, when I was 19, I could sleep through just about anything. I could curl up in any corner and not wake up until the next morning. Oh, blessed days, I remember those. <laughs> Here, Jesus seems to be just like I used to be out like a light. He sleeps right through the noise of the storm and the wet waves that keep crashing into the boat until the disciples wake him up. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They ask. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I think their question is a bit, a bit odd, don't you think? I mean, in the midst of such danger, right there in the midst of this terrible storm, you would think that they would call out for help. Like, wake up! Help us! We're in trouble! Do something! But instead, they ask a question. Teacher, not Lord, not Master, but teacher as though this moment of peril and danger was a time to teach of all things. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? That question, I think, has been echoing throughout the history of the church. You see, traditionally, this story has been interpreted to be about the church. Yes, the church portrayed as this rickety little boat on a stormy sea that is the world, with us, the disciples, inside the boat, along with the sleeping Jesus. It's about the church. We're getting to the point now, so turn to your neighbor, say to your neighbor, it's about the church. This is so great you have neighbors to talk to. <laughs> Whole new idea. Throughout Christian history, good church folks have read this story and have assumed that it's about them. The church of Jesus Christ in a hostile world, facing the perils and dangers of a world in upheaval and crisis. It's about the church. And so the question that the disciples ask is our question too. Teacher. Do you not care that the church is in trouble? Teacher, do you not care that our church had to shut down because of COVID and now is stressing about when and how to reopen? Teacher, do you not care that our disagreements and our politics have invaded the Christian church to the point where the Southern Baptists meeting in Nashville last week were fighting furiously over the future direction of the largest Protestant denomination in America? Teacher, do you not care that the Roman Catholic bishops are honestly studying whether they should withhold communion from people? Teacher, do you not care? Jesus, of course, cares very much. And Jesus cares not just about the church, but he cares about the whole world. So let's expand this traditional image a little. Let's say that this story is not just about the church, it's not just about us, but that this story is about the world. Turn to your other neighbor, say, it's about the world. Yes, it's about the world. It, it's about a world that is groan, groaning in pain and that seems to spin out of control on a daily basis. A world that is adrift in a sea of trouble. In the time of the Apostle Paul, things weren't all that different. Paul writes to the Corinthians in this second reading from today, and he talks about the great afflictions that they are dealing with, the hardships, the calamities, the beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless night, hunger, hunger. Did you hear that whole list when he was read? All of which he has experienced himself, and all of which are signs of a world in conflict and crisis, a world not so different from our own. Today is World Refugee Day, a day proclaimed by the United Nations to draw attention to the plight of those who have fled their homes because of violence or famine or war or natural disaster. For whatever reason, the truth is, today we face the largest refugee crisis that humankind has ever faced because more people than ever are refugees from one crisis or another. According to the latest UN estimates, there are 82 million refugees in the world today. Do you realize that's 1% of the entire world population? Millions of people fleeing for their very lives. So perhaps this Malkin story of Jesus' boat caught in a violent storm can also illustrate a third interpretation. It's about refugees. 
Turn your neighbor again. This time say to your neighbor, it's about refugees. As of last Friday, June the 18th, 815 refugees have died so far this year trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea as they flee from the war in Syria and the poverty of Libya and attempt to make their way to the safety of Europe. Yes, that's the same sea around which Western civilization developed, the very cradle of Christianity. Thousands upon thousands of refugees, human beings like you and me with hopes and dreams, have perished in that very sea over these past few years. Estimates say that as many as 12,000 may have been lost at sea, their bodies never found. The problem is getting worse by the day. Europe has been flooded by wave after wave of refugees. Germany, for example, in 2015, took in and for the most part successfully integrated more than a million refugees. And Italy has been dealing with receiving and welcoming those fleeing from Syria and Libya and Sudan across the Mediterranean. But anti-immigrant attitudes are rising in Europe as they have been in our own country. See, there may not be a sea between Mexico and the United States, but there is a desert. And refugees die there by the thousands as they flee violence and poverty in Central America. The U.S. Border Patrol reports that in the last two years, 7,000 deaths have occurred, with many more going unnoticed, and that 2020 was the deadliest year along the U.S. southern border with more than 500 official deaths. Those where they found a body. Like the disciples imploring Jesus, can you hear the cries of the refugees? America, do you not care that we are perishing? America, do you not care that children are dying? America, do you not care that thousands upon thousands are drowning or perishing in the wilderness? The disciples cry out to Jesus, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? But Jesus does care. In the story, Jesus wakes up, and Jesus commands the storm to be still. In the story, Jesus then asks, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? To show the disciples that they are not alone and that their faith, that they can make a difference, that their faith can do just about anything. And in the world, my siblings in Christ, in the world, this story plays out in the same way. Jesus wakes up. Jesus wakes up and he commands the evil in this world to subside and he shields us with his mercy and grace so that we can stand as a beacon of hope in a broken world. Purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech and the power of God, those are the gifts that Paul lists in his letter to the Corinthians as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And those are the gifts that we have to make this a better world, to hear the cries of the refugees and all those who are in need. Those are the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are the antidote to the current suffering of the world. Jesus gives us those tools that we need to stand in solidarity with those who are suffering and to demand a better world and a more just society for our children. Faith, that is trust in God, will still any storm. That's the lesson in this gospel story today, and it's the most important thing that you will hear anywhere this week. Faith, trust in God, will still any storm. So if you don't remember anything else of what I said in this whole sermon, remember this. Trust in God will still any storm. Say it with me. Trust in God will still any storm. Truth is, we are all in the same boat. 
We are all children of God in need of God's grace and mercy. And God doesn't distinguish between a Somal Somalian refugee struggling against all odds in the middle of the ocean and a middle-class retired woman from Kerry sitting in a church pew on Sunday morning. In God's eyes, we are all beloved children, children of God with equal value, loved by God with all the fierce and overwhelming love that only God can muster. We are all in the same boat. A couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to close with this, a couple of weeks ago, our North Carolina Synod held its annual assembly. And one of the highlights for me was a greeting that the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry, had recorded for the assembly. Now, I'm getting into dangerous territory here. Michael Curry is known as one of the best preachers in the world. You know, he preached for the royal wedding a couple of weeks ago, a couple of years ago with Harry and Meghan and all that, so you, I know you have heard him. And to invite him into my sermon is a bit of a risk because you might compare me to him. But in any case, he said something I want you to hear, and I want to conclude by sharing a, just a short selection from his address, a short clip of what Bishop Curry told us about the common humanity that we all share. Here's Bishop Curry. Enjoy. One of the realities is, as the poet John Donne said, no man is an island entire unto itself. Dr. King said, we are all tied in networks of destiny. I am your brother, you are my sister, we are siblings. We are all tied together. The same God created us all and that makes us all children of the one God who is the creator of all. And therefore we are brothers, sisters, siblings, one of another. We are tied together. Uh, the late Shirley Chisholm, who was a member of Congress, spoke of the American experiment. And she said, basically, with the exception of the indigenous people who inhabited the land before anybody else, uh, we all came over here on, on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. What else can you say to this but amen? <laughs> 